This is the first video lecture I'm posting for our class during this remote learning period. Um, you should be tuning in to watch it if you're in my G period class Monday morning at 9.30 a.m. And if you're in my A period class, you should be tuning in Tuesday at 12.45 p.m. I don't mind if you watch early, but during that first half hour of those class periods, you should be watching this video. A few technical notes before we get into the meat and potatoes of today's lesson. First, I have posted an outline of the lecture I'm about to deliver in the description underneath this video. So take a look, see what's there. I'll add timestamps for about what point of the lecture we're in. The reason I'm doing this is so it's easy for you to follow along. If you want to take notes, copy and paste the lecture, put it into Google Docs or your word processor of choice, and fill out the skeleton outline I've put there. If you're feeling lost during the video at any point, hit pause, figure out where in the video you are, click back to the last heading that made sense to you and watch through again. I recommend you glance at the outline from time to time in order to make sure you know where we are in this video. Quick reminder, immediately after this video is over, or shortly after, so you have a little bit of time for re-watching sections or to take a break in between, we're going to do a live stream. I'll expect all of you to be there, logged in on your school account, uh, prepared to comment and participate in the discussion based on this lecture. And I will, of course, be asking questions specific to this lecture, so don't expect to do well in that discussion if you haven't been paying attention. Hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Juniors, welcome to our first digital video lecture. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the supernatural virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and love. Um, I'm going to take a moment and just review what we mean by a virtue and review what the natural virtues were so we can understand how they're different from the supernatural virtues. That's where we really get into it for the day. So first, a quick review of stuff I'm sure you know and I'm sure none of you forgot. Um, we're going to look at what it means for something to be a virtue. And rather than go through the whole discussion again, I'm just going to pull a quick book off the shelf and we're going to get a definition. The text here is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, by the way. I think one of you asked in the comments what my second favorite book is, the books on my shelf that are not the Bible. Here's the big winner. Um, you'll notice mine is a little bit worse for wear having read through it several times over, but still a handy source. We're going to look in paragraph 1803 for our definition of a virtue. <clears throat> a virtue is a habitual and firm disposition to do the good. Habitual, firm disposition to do good. By habitual, we mean it's the result of repeated actions. You need to practice this in order to have it as a virtue. By firm, I mean there's a matter of consistency here. You don't just do the thing because it's convenient for you or happens to work out that one time. Um, it's really part of who you are. By disposition, we mean a, a tendency, your, your orientation is towards this thing, but really it's about the thing you actually want to do. So if you find yourself constantly resisting the same temptation, say, for example, someone working on the virtue of temperance might constantly have to say no to dessert, no to snacks, no to junk food, etc. Um, they don't have the full disposition yet. It becomes your disposition when you really want to do that thing, when it's no longer a struggle to say no to those things. So the person who's constantly fighting to say no, good job, keep up the good work. You are habituating a virtue but you don't have it yet. Not until that's not a struggle. And then the last part of this definition, the good. That's the moral good. That's the good that results in deep, flourishing human happiness by means of right relationship. Remember, whenever we talk about the good, we're talking about what actually makes people happy in relationship with one another. So, there's our idea of a virtue. Habitual, firm disposition to do the Good. Now let's take a quick recap on natural virtues. I'm sure all of you remember them, um, so we'll go through very quickly. The four cardinal or natural virtues are prudence, justice, 
temperance, and fortitude. Um, we've already kind of gone in depth on those, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I do want to take a second and unpack what it means that they are natural. It means they're a function of human nature. That's what the natural and natural virtues mean. It's human nature to do these things. Two implications. One, just by the fact that you're human, you are capable of cultivating those four virtues. And two, because you're human, you won't be happy unless you do. You absolutely must accomplish those virtues in yourself. Not because God's telling you to, not because those are the rules, because you can't be happy without them. That's just not what it means to be human. Um, if that sounds a little strict or a little harsh, imagine with me for a moment what an adult would look like without those virtues cultivated at all. Picture a man without any temperance. He can't say no to food, to junk food. Whenever he feels like eating, he eats whatever he feels like. Imagine that, what that would do to his health and to his relationships. Whenever he sees strong drink and he wants it, he cannot say no to that. We have a word for someone in that situation, and it's not a friendly word. He cannot say no to his sexual appetites. Imagine what that's going to do to his relationships. Now, honest question, is that someone you want to grow up to be like? Imagine instead, if it's easier for you, a woman without fortitude, who as an adult is still always doing what her mother or her friend groups want her to do, because breaking away from the group and doing what she thinks she should do, even when it's different than those expectation setters, is scary or difficult or challenging. She never does what is right to her, because that would be hard. She's always just going to go with the flow. Does that sound like someone you want to grow up to be like? I didn't think so. That's what we mean by saying these virtues are natural. Everyone can accomplish them, and everyone must, but only if they want to be happy. If they want to be miserable, by all means, don't. Um, the supernatural virtues we need to understand are different. They're not a function of just human nature. They're a function of grace. Building upon nature, God has to put these into our souls. And then we grow and develop them. And the primary way he does this, by the way, is the sacraments. That means these virtues are more received than they are cultivated, although we'll talk later about cultivation. And they come primarily through the sacraments. They are distinctly Christian. These are not across all of human beings, every when and everywhere, like the natural virtues. They're unique to Christianity. Wait a second. Did Mr. Howell just say that only Christians can love? He said love is one of the supernatural virtues, and he said that the supernatural virtues are uniquely Christian. Are you saying atheists, Muslims, etc., people who aren't Christian can't love? No, I'm not saying other people aren't capable of love. What I am saying is that there is a uniquely Christian understanding of love that's going to be different than and absent from other faith traditions or non-faith traditions. There is something distinctive here. So I'm going to take a minute and get into what we mean by faith and hope. We're going to put those two virtues together before we look at charity. Um, and there's a basic way I want you to understand these. When you hear faith, I need you to think believe. And when you hear hope, I need you to think trust. And when we do that, a lot of things are very quickly going to fall in place because I'm going to explain these virtues, these attitudes in the heart from God by drawing on experiences you already have. So first, I need you to take a moment and remember a recent time when you told someone, I believe you. Ideally, at some time you said it to someone's face, not over a screen if we can help it. There's an irony in me disparaging screen to screen instead of in-person conversations on a YouTube video, isn't there? Anyway, when was the last time you told someone, I believe you? Or instead, think of a time when someone recently said to you, I believe you. I'm looking for those important words. You need to have an actual scenario in mind because we're going to work with this example for the next few minutes. So I'll give you a second to come up with one if you haven't already. Now next, I need you to come up with another scenario, another recent time in your life, but this time I'm looking for a memory in which you told someone, I trust you. And again, I'm looking for those important words delivered in an intense and personal way. I 
trust you. Or when someone said that to you, I trust you. Do you have a particular memory in mind yet? Because you're going to need one. If you don't, pause the video. When's a recent time? I believe you. When's a recent time? I trust you. If you need to take a second and pause at this point, that's fine. Make sure you have those two memories at the ready. So, we're going to reflect on those two memories you just came up with. And first, I want to look at what's similar between them. What's similar between those two memories that you're holding on to, those two examples of trust and belief going on in your recent history? Um, most likely, both people you said that to or you heard that from were close friends or family members. They might have even been the same person. You had a positive relationship with them. You had a positive attitude towards them. And that's going to be our key similarity between faith and hope. They are both positive attitudes towards God. They both have the character of looking at God and saying yes, rather than saying no. Excuse me, one moment. Next, I need you to think about the difference between these two situations. What was different between the time you said, I believe you, versus the time you said, I trust you? Take a second and think about that for a minute. It can be a little tricky. What's the big difference between I believe you and I trust you? I think this one's a little harder to tease out. I'm gonna help you along a little bit. I believe you, generally when we use those words, refers to facts. Actions already performed, situations already firmly established. Stuff that's already happened or that you already know for sure. Someone tells you their story or tells you their side of the story and you say, I believe you. It's usually what we're talking about. However, I trust you tends not to be about facts so much as intentions or promises or goals, right? Um, you don't usually say, I trust you for stuff you've done. It's for stuff you're going to do. I don't know how you're going to get out of this situation, but I trust that you can pull it off. Um, the I believe you is a little more objective. It's about the situation on the ground. The I trust you is almost more about the person's character. I have no idea how you're going to do this, but it doesn't matter because you're you and you'll get it done. Um, Latin scholars, you're going to love this. For the rest of you, nerd out with me for a second on grammar. Belief is specifically about things in the indicative mood. Hope, trust, is about things in the subjunctive mood. Those of you who are pretty clear on your grammar and your moods of verbs, that should make a lot of sense to you. So. We got a sense of how these two virtues are similar, how they're different. We're going to spend a few minutes now talking about each individual virtue. We're going to do faith first. So here's my definition for you for faith. And yeah, it's a definition, so you kind of got to know this at this point. Probably want to write these down. Faith is the virtue of saying, I believe you to God. Faith is the virtue of saying, I believe you to God especially about things God has already done and already told us. So take a second and check in. What are things God's already done and already told us he's done? Salvation history is laid out in scripture. What does God say he did? What does he tell us through Moses, through the prophets, through the apostles? Those are things at which we're supposed to look and say to God through those authors, I believe you. Miracles, when they occur as evidence of God's divine intervention and providence. The fact that sin and death have already been, been defeated by Jesus through his passion, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. That that salvation is already accomplished. That's kind of the biggie here for faith. Other things would include um, the moral teachings of the church. Or the idea is that we obtain grace through the sacraments, through the ordained ministers, through those purpose. These are all things God has told us and established for us. 
they're objects of faith. And that's what I mean by objects of faith. There's things towards with which faith is the correct response. We look at those things and say, you know what, God, I believe you. Put another way, faith is the virtue that says God is not a liar. He's not a liar. He knows what he's talking about. He tells the truth. The opposite of faith is doubt. Its opposite is doubt. It's when you disbelieve what God teaches you, either directly through scripture, through the church, etc. Doubt is not morally neutral. And this is somewhere our pop culture, or our, our secular culture is dead wrong. It's not a matter of you do you, I do me, you believe what you need to believe, I believe what need you need to believe, and we're all just okay. Well, that would be fine if God didn't exist, or if he was just an idea or a concept out there somewhere. But he's not. He's a person. In fact, he's a community of three persons of mutual love. And that person, those persons, are reaching out to you. Um, imagine you're, say, walking down the hallway and a classmate of yours run, runs up to you and tells you something that's a little hard to believe, but he's really excited about it. You can't stay neutral at that point. Do you believe him or not? Do you trust him or not? That's what's happening here. Choosing to reject something God has taught us through scripture, through the church, through direct revelation, whatever it is, choosing to reject something God has taught us is not uh, a morally neutral you do you kind of thing. Um, it's an accusation. I don't believe you. You're a liar. That's what it says. Now, honestly, I need you to reflect for a moment. Can you have a healthy relationship, a happy relationship, with someone who looks at you and calls you a liar when you're not? It doesn't work, does it? Can you have a healthy, happy relationship with a person who every time they open their mouth, you know they're lying. You don't believe them. That relationship's going to die. That's what doubt is. That's what happens when you reject a matter of doctrine. It's a rejection of God, his means of communication, and the fact that he's not a liar. That's why faith is such a virtue. It looks at another person, at the persons of the Trinity, and says, I believe you. And please understand, doubt is a, a choice, not a feeling. This isn't the same as, I understand. I mean, if someone comes up to you and tells you something you already know, you almost don't need to believe them, right? You already know. But when they're telling something you don't understand, or that's hard to get, or you haven't heard before, that's where it's a matter of, I believe you. I wasn't there, but I believe your side of the story, right? Um, when you just don't get it, when a teaching doesn't make sense to you, or you're like, I have no idea how I'm supposed to take that, that's okay. It's a misunderstanding. It's a lack of clarity. There's no real problem there. Um, you don't always need to understand what the other person means to communicate, simply put. Um, maybe you seek clarity. Maybe you try to understand. That's what the study of theology is for, is <laughs> so that you can generate, develop your understanding of these things you've already chosen to believe. But you have to start with, I believe you. Doubts when you choose to reject, when you say, I don't get it, and therefore, I disbelieve you. Doubt is the opposite of faith. It's a rejection of something you've been told. Next up is hope. If faith is the virtue that looks at God and says, I believe you, then hope is the virtue that looks at God and says, I trust you. Now remember that difference between faith and believe. We talked about faith as for objective realities already established, um, things that are certain. And we looked at trust as matters of, well, I don't really know. It hasn't happened yet. I'm not sure what this means, but I put my trust in you personally. Um, God intends to do good things for you. 
for me, for all of humanity. Remember, God creates and it is good. He creates the man and the woman and they are good and he intends good things for them. That means all of history, including all of human history, is pointed at a good end, which will ultimately be satisfying, will be good. That's an object of hope. We don't know what that's going to look like or what, the, what that means. But if God really is all powerful, and he's all loving, it can't help but be that way. Even though it's not obvious for us right now in the middle of it. And you personally, in your own life, you're going to suffer. Of course, you're going to have dark times. Absolutely. We're in the middle of one right now, right? We're in the middle of a, a national epidemic and schools are closed and everything's shutting down. That's a dark time and it's got a lot of suffering with it. I'm not afraid, are you? The reason I'm not afraid is because I have hope. A joyful expectation that even something as bad as this, God is going to bring to a good end. And it really is not greater than we can handle, not some absolute evil. Remember, God became man so that man might become God. You have legitimate grounds to hope that you can be like God, that you can be sinless, that you can be perfected in these virtues, that you can be deeply and abidingly happy in this life as well as in the next. That's good news. That's what our hope is about. Um, put another way, hope is the virtue that says God is not a jerk. I know it sounds a little silly to say it that way, right? Um, God's not a jerk. So when you're not sure what something means or how it's going to turn out, you got to put an element of trust. Look, he's a good guy. He's going to do the right thing. Um, the opposite of this virtue of hope is despair. It's when we fail to trust that God is going to take good care of us, either on the macro level of the whole of human history or really more deeply on the personal level. God's not going to take care of me. And there's two reasons people might think this accidentally. They don't usually admit them to themselves, but usually one of those two things is going on in their soul. One, they think that evil and suffering and death are too big or too heavy or, or too problematic for God to fix. Come on, he's God. The other and the more serious one is when people decide to believe that God's just not going to bother, that he doesn't love you enough to get up and help to participate, to save. That's ugly. That's doubting a friend. Um, my favorite philosopher, uh, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, ha has a great quote about this. By the way, you notice you're looking at my whole library. There's only one section of my whole library that is entirely devoted to one author, and it's this whole section over here, and it's to Soren Kierkegaard. The big money quote for this is his. He says, to despair is to deny that God is love. To despair is to deny that God is love. Take a moment and please reflect. Can you have a healthier relationship with a friend who you think doesn't care about you? You think this person cares nothing for you and wouldn't really reach out to help you if you needed them. Is that a healthy friendship? Or you have a friend who thinks that about you, even though you would do anything to help them. They just don't believe it. They just don't trust you for it. Not a good relationship situation, is it? Again, despair is not this morally neutral. You think people are good and that they can be saved. I think people just kind of disappear when they die and suffering and death is the end. Those are not morally neutral philosophical positions. They're either accepting or rejecting friendship with a divine person, the divine persons who are reaching out to you. There's a relationship implication here. Again, despair is not a feeling. You are going to feel overwhelmed. You are going to get depressed. You are going to suffer. I promise. God promises. Um, if God himself, when he became man, suffered, and boy, did he suffer, you're going to as well. Your suffering is never going to be too great to bear. It's never going to be just because God wants you to suffer. It is all ordered towards the good towards your salvation, towards the cultivation of true happiness and right relationship with God and neighbor. 
Now that takes a lot of trust. That takes a real joyful enthusiasm to, to fight back against those feelings. But you can't give in to those feelings. You must resist. That's what hope is. It's this, this passionate joy, this excitement, even in the face of dark times. Hope. Saying to God, I trust you. Or saying, God's not a jerk. Whew. These videos are hard. Why is it that it takes me more energy to deliver my lesson to one computer screen than it does to manage 20 something of you with all your different computer screens? This is so much more draining. I don't get it. Anyway, next point. It is important that you not mix up the objects of faith with the objects of hope. Those two virtues, while they're both good, are ordered towards different things. And when you start swapping what you point them towards, you're going to run into spiritual trouble. I want to give you two important examples of this. One is universalism. Universalism is the heresy. That's bad. We don't do heresy. We don't like that. Is the heresy that says that all people are guaranteed to be saved. Literally everyone from all of history is definitely getting to heaven. That is a matter of belief. But that's not what God promised us. What God promised us is that everyone has the opportunity to achieve salvation. Every human being who has lived, is living now, or will live, has a fair shot at achieving salvation. But he never said everyone's actually going to make that choice. People have free will, and they can reject that happiness, that invitation. Universalism. So when you take a legitimate hope for salvation of others and try to drag it into an object of faith as if God had promised that when he didn't. There's a similar and I think more serious issue in the sin of presumption. Presumption is when you take something similar to universalism, but at the personal level. It's when you take for granted that you will achieve salvation. Hey, God's like my buddy, so I'm getting into heaven no matter what. Doesn't matter if I sin or never show up at mass or never give the man the time of day, right? I'm sorry, that's not what he said. You are invited to participate in this beautiful, joyful, loving relationship with God. But he's not going to force you. He's not going to drag you. You need to participate. You need to work out your salvation. You need to develop this relationship. You don't get to just assume, hey, God's not a jerk, so I get to go to heaven no matter what. No, just because he's not a jerk doesn't mean he's a pushover. He's got expectations for you, and he wants your time and your attention and your love. That's where salvation is. That's what heaven is. Um, don't just assume that you're tagging along for the party, even though you've never spent a minute with the guy. Presumption. Again, you're taking an object of hope. I sincerely and joyfully hope and expect that I'm going to make it. Not. I'm guaranteed to make it. I got a free shot. Confusing the objects of faith and hope. I want to take a minute and review a few points we've covered before we get into the next topic, charity. Um, these are virtues. They're supernatural virtues, so they start with an infusion of grace into the soul. Um, but they're virtues, so they need to be habituated. Which leads us to a very tricky question. If these are virtues, then in order to habituate them, to make them a habitual disposition of the, the character, um, you have to practice them. How do you practice faith? Isn't it just like a default setting kind of thing in your soul? How do you practice hope in order to habituate them? And how do you do it if God's got to make the first move in your soul for these? That's an excellent question. And it's one you guys are going to answer for me in our live stream today. So if you need to, rewind the last few seconds and watch that question again when we get into the live stream today. That's one of the questions you guys are going to be discussing and answering for me. Can't wait. So, next, we want to talk about charity, aka love. And right away, you're going to notice this virtue is a little different because we have two different words for it. We call it charity, we call it love. And the reason for that is that both of these words are partially incorrect. Not in the meaning of the word, but in the implication, the way it's thrown around in popular slang English. So charity correctly conveys the idea that this virtue is a, a giving of oneself. That's what we mean by charity. What we don't mean is you're throwing money around in the hopes of getting a tax deduction. That's got nothing to do with the virtue. So when we say charity, you got to kind of mentally filter a little bit. Giving of oneself, but not really about the money. 
Likewise, when we use the word love for this virtue, we're conveying something true, but we also have to be careful about a wrong implication. Love desires a relationship with the other person. When you love someone, you want to be with them. You want to get to know them. Um, you want to interact with them and spend time with them, right? But when we talk about love as a virtue, we're not talking about romantic or erotic love. See, a lot of us assume love means what it means on a Valentine's Day card, this sort of overly sappy, sentimental, emotional attachment that's going to die out in a few weeks because it's a feeling your you know, psyche can't actually sustain. Um, and it comes with a certain foolishness, almost a mental insanity of falling in love where you suspend good judgment. Um, that's not what we mean by the virtue. Or, unfortunately, and particularly in pop music and art culture, love is often code word for a very different four-letter word. Um, I want to love you, right? As a couple of the dance songs go. That's not what we mean here. Desiring of relationship, yes. Not with some of the foolishness and vice that goes with some of the more excessive emotional attachments. I'm gonna use the word charity because I think that's a little less distracting given our cultural milieu, but I'll probably jump back and forth between charity and love so we don't get too hung up on any one of those implications. Um, Here's the good news. You already have a definition for love. I'm sure all of you have it memorized. I suspect some of you have it, say, tattooed over your heart. It's a definition we've used a dozen times and we will continue to use, and you should probably just recite it to yourself every day. You know why. It comes from our guy, St. Thomas Aquinas, everyone's favorite theologian. Um, Say it with me. Come on, like this is one of those kids shows, like Sesame Street. You remember you watched as a kid, right? You're gonna do this one with me? Everybody, to love, is to will the good of the other. Never forget it. We're gonna use that all the time. So, like faith and hope, the virtue of love, the virtue of charity, is an attitude towards God. Charity is an attitude towards God, and it's a positive attitude. It's another one that says yes to God rather than no. You'll notice it's a theme in all these virtues. The virtue is saying yes to God's invitation to relationship. The vice, the opposite, is obviously the rejection thereof. Um, if God is already good, if he's already infinitely good, he is, by the way, um, how do we will what's good for him? What would be good for God? His own will. What God wills is good. It's in his nature. It's in his essence to be good. And therefore, when we act in charity, we act in accord with God's will. Um, I'm going to give you an example of this. So we're going to go back to my library and draw from my favorite. Of course, this time we're... I like to use the, the, the big Bible for readings like this. It's kind of fun. So I'm going to open up to Matthew. We're in chapter 26. This is when Jesus is in the garden after the Last Supper, but before he's arrested, he knows he's about to be arrested, tortured, humiliated, and executed. And here's what he prays. He began to grow sorrowful and to be sad. He said to them, My soul is sorrowful, even unto death. Stay here and watch with me. Going a little further, he fell upon his face, praying, and said, Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Not as I will, but as you will. That's what charity, as an attitude in the heart, a disposition towards God, looks like. Not what I will, but what you will. We pray this in the Lord's Prayer, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's the submission of my will to God's. Here's what I want, but really what God wants is going to be better. So I might as well just want that. Um, that's a correct attitude. That's a well-ordered attitude towards God. Um, there's an interesting little insight or connection here. Because God is all good, all loving, we will God's good by uniting our will to his will. But there's a, a perk here. Because God is also not just all good, but also all powerful, 
you're never going to be frustrated when you unite your will, your will to God's. You can't lose, as it were, when you go out and will something, desire something, work for something. Um, you might fail. It happens. Except when you're willing what God wills. See, because it's all-powerful, his will will be accomplished. Again, drawing again, this time from St. Paul. St. Paul, I'm in 1 Corinthians 13. Charity never fails. And later, these three things remain, faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is charity. You never get it wrong when your will conforms to the good of God's will. Kind of cool, huh? So, we've looked at faith, we've looked at hope, we've looked at charity. We've looked at all of these as positive attitudes towards God. But, aren't these just kind of churchy spiritual things that people do when they pray and they don't necessarily apply to you and me if we're not doing the whole believe in God prayer thing? Aren't they just religious in the secular sense of some private thing that goes on inside church or inside your own prayer life but not out in the community? Nope. Utter nonsense. Because these virtues cannot help but affect your relationships with other people. Just because they're supernatural coming from God doesn't mean they're going to reflect, uh, they're not going to reflect out on the whole community and your interactions with other people. They absolutely will. Let's look at how that works. But wait, first, a tricky question for you. Why does that have to be true? Why do your attitudes towards God necessarily affect your attitudes towards other people. I mean, we could imagine that those are separate things, that they don't really interact with each other, right? But, you're saying they absolutely go together. They, they logically must. Why? That's another great question that you all will be answering in your live stream today. I look forward to your lively discussion on trying to piece that one together. By the way, a hint. We said these are distinctly Christian virtues. That means the answer to that tricky question must be located in Christ, in who Jesus is. That should be a pretty helpful hint. So, rather than try to explain systematically for you how each of these spiritual, supernatural virtues affects relationships with other people via the other virtues, I'm just going to give you three reflection questions that should set you off in the right direction. First, faith. How does your faith, you're saying, I believe you to God in the things he's revealed to us, affect your relationships with other people? Well, here's one, just one way to reflect on this question. How would your behavior towards other people look if you believed that the only way for them to really be happy was to accept and live out the full moral teaching of the Catholic Church? A little different? How would you act towards other people if you believed that the only way for them to be deeply and abidingly happy in life was to do it the way God has told us through the church? Think about one or two of your relationships. Got a sense of the difference I'm talking about? Next, let's look at hope. Hope, we said, is the virtue of saying, I trust you to God. <laughs> Proclaiming that God is not a jerk. Um, so here's a question for you now. Apply this to your relationships. How would your behavior and your attitudes towards other people look if you fully expected and were looking forward to spending eternity with them in heaven? Imagine every person you interact with. Imagine someone you're happy you're not going to see for the next couple of weeks while we're out of school. How would your attitude towards them be different if you were eagerly looking forward to spending eternity with them in heaven? You'd kind of have to treat them a little differently, wouldn't you? And third, charity. How would your relationships with other people be different if your heart were on fire with charity? Um, simply put, does every action you commit towards other people 
reflect God's love for them. God is madly in love with other people the same way he's madly in love with you. Do your actions reflect that passionate desire, that burning desire for relationship, for right relationship with other people with whom you interact? That's what the virtue of charity looks like. It's not always obvious that your will conforms to God's. It's kind of abstract. It is always obvious that you are on fire with love for other people. That's how it hits your relationships with other people. That's going to conclude our lecture for today. I want to take a minute and just briefly review what we went over. Um, and what you should expect in the live stream in a few minutes. We talked about virtues as habitual, firm dispositions to do the good. You should be prepared to know what each of those words mean and how they talk to each other in that definition. We talked about supernatural virtues as different from natural virtues and as a function of grace rather than human nature. By the way, we had a tricky question about that. Um, the question was, how do you practice supernatural virtues, especially as to this about faith and hope? We defined three supernatural virtues. We defined faith as the virtue of saying, I believe you to God, or of saying, God is not a liar. We defined hope as the virtue of saying, I trust you to God, or of saying, God's not a jerk. And we defined charity as willing the good of another. Well, Thomas Aquinas defined it as that, um, and as conforming your will to God's will, especially as it regards love of other people. Um, and in addition, you have a, a, or another reflection question, in addition to the one about forming supernatural virtues, your job is to figure out for our live, live stream discussion today um, why it's necessary that these Theological virtues affect your relationships with other people and not just your relationship with God. Looking forward to seeing you in a few minutes in our live stream. Feel free to go back and rewatch a key part of the video if you find that helpful. God bless.